All right. Okay, so let's talk about strategy development. So you've got objectives, improving things like your controls, your incident response, lowering your risk, and so on. And so you might want to do things like implement a security information and event management system like Splunk. You pretty much need one of them if you want to have any level of security maturity. Uh, implement a security response, instant response program or an awareness program. All these are things you'll find in a mature company. Uh, if you want to improve your existing capabilities, then you might want to just better integrate your systems and link your security awareness and management, you know, this sort of thing. Um, more making your existing systems work better together. And then you can do gap assessment. Um, you figure out the desired state and you figure out your current state and you determine what the gap is between those things. So uh, you consider various ways of measuring what you have to decide whether you have achieved your goal yet or not. And uh, there's other things you would consider, your previous records of previous risk treatments, your third-party risk, and so on. And so, examining security program is a common one. One thing uh, immature companies often say is, well, we have never been hacked. And I remember for five years ago, everyone surveys admitted that everybody that could tell knew it that they'd been hacked and they said there's only two kinds of businesses in America the businesses that know they've been hacked by China and the ones that have been hacked by China but they don't know it and so uh, if you don't know if you don't think you've been hacked but you don't have a way to detect attacks then you don't really know so your security program will um, have various uh, fake policies and things that are there just to make it look like you're secure but they aren't really and uh, so it can be quite a job, and you can have activities that go on that are not really recorded. Parts of your company are not really included in the program, stuff that's going on off the books. There's a lot of things that go on at companies, and this is why it's a big step when your company first becomes compliant with a standard. That means you have to stop a whole lot of bad practices. Um, so one way to analyze it in this way, helpful and harmful, and internal and external, so the good stuff is strengths and opportunities external, and the bad stuff is weaknesses and threats coming in from the outside. Um, so there's models of maturity. This is one from Carnegie Mellon, the CMMI dev, and it has various levels. Your initial um, level is where you just you do the work, and the work gets done to some extent, but you don't even measure it, and you don't even have records of how you did it, so it's not done the same way every time. If it's repeatable, then at least you've determined some standard procedures and people are repeating the same process. If it's defined, then it's well documented and you understand what you're doing. And then there's managed, which means you actually measure how well your security program is accomplishing things. And the best is optimizing, where you measure the results of your security program and use those measurements to improve the program continuously in a cycle. So those are various maturity models. Now, you might not want to get to the, the optimizing model for every process at your company. That might be a waste of money. Um, so you determine what how mature you need to be for the processes. Some of them, a lower level of maturity would be enough. You can determine a roadmap to plan how to get to your objective step by step. And here's an example, which is a Gantt chart. I've seen these used for project management where you have all these different things happening on a different timeline. And so you'd have a three to six month plan to indicate, to put in some identity and access management governance. And then in 12 to 18 months, you want to uh, automate the workflow and have tracking and auditing and preliminary role-based access control. And then in 12 to 18 months, you'll have a more fully provisioned new authentication scheme across your enterprise and all these different parts of it has to have to get improved, like training people on it here and so on. Um, this is the kind of thing you have to do. I worked on a project that was a financial project for a lawsuit that went for about four years long, and I was one of these little arrows, 
and it turned out that my step was slow and they flew in all these experts to find out why I was holding up the whole program and it turned out I was holding it up for a good reason but if I hadn't have been they would have got rid of me anyway um, so you got policies these are the rules of the road typically you tie it to a framework like one of these that we've already talked about and uh, then you have controls which are the uh, barriers that prevent people from doing things that are forbidden to some extent and so each control has some reason for it to exist some scope the part of the company controlled by this control and some way to test it to see if it's actually accomplishing your goal and you may need to change the controls if your tests show that your control is not achieving your goal and there are control frameworks there's a few of them the CSC 27002 and NIST 800 they all have similar um, list of controls we've seen them before like the SANS 20 security controls so you have policies that determine what it's going to be in a vague general way like you would have a policy that customer data is protected and not exposed to unauthorized policy unauthorized people and then you have standards which determine what you use uh, exactly how you accomplish that and the standards change as you change your hardware and software platforms so your standards have to be developed carefully you have to successfully implement them and uh, you have to automate them as much as possible you don't want to have people manually doing things more than necessary and so you'll specify a vendor a configuration a methodology to measure it and often tie it to one of these control frameworks so you find the processes of things things people are doing in your company that are not written down and you write documents I did this a lot when I started working at an escrow agency there was a bunch of undocumented processes and I made a book and started documenting the processes um, so you develop standards so now there's consistency other other workers can use the book to follow the same steps and that makes things more consistent so you define roles and responsibilities so people know what their job is uh, there was a time when about eight years ago when they paid for an independent audit of the administration of the college which had come into question because of an accreditation problem and they interviewed our management at the college and they found out that three quarters of them could not even tell you what their job was they didn't even know what they were trying to do this is not good people should know what their job is there should be a document explaining what they should do and there should be somebody measuring whether they do it so security awareness training is um, considered a strong it's considered a defense against phishing people argue about it but most people think that if your users are trained about security threats they're less likely to make foolish mistakes like clicking on links in emails or plugging in USB sticks they find on the ground so if you want to implement any kind of uh, security improvement you have to explain what's the problem what are you trying to accomplish how are you going to measure success what do you need and your plan how long will it take how much will it cost this is what you must do to convince your management to invest in a security improvement so your business case has to explain how this fits into your company's business and how it will improve your business in some way so there's communications and reporting board of directors meetings happen periodically for big issues you have steering committees and then various other levels um, and of course there are you can measure how many security incidents there are and other metrics to determine the, the health of your security program it is a huge problem in most companies the technical people are at the bottom and the people at the top are typically not technical and only want to hear business case in terms of like dollars and profit and loss and so um, it's a problem um, so you have to somehow inform and guide management and you must avoid using fear uncertainty and doubt this is where you just scare them with a scary thing without that's not really based in fact this is something vendors often do scare people into buying some kind of product um, with exaggerated claims that it will save you from some exaggerated threat so there's also a normalcy bias a lot of people will assume that everything's fine because they think they haven't been hacked you know like the famous meme here um, so it is it is a problem to get people that don't think there's a problem convince them to spend money on security it usually can't be done most experienced security professionals I've talked to say you can't do anything until a company actually gets hacked or maybe hacked a few times 
That's what will motivate them to actually improve security. Until that happens, they won't believe it's real. That may not be true anymore, but I think it still is true, at least there's a lot of small businesses. So here's some things that limit your strategy. People just don't want to change. They And the culture of the company matters. Um, if you have a strong or healthy company, like I've described, where people are motivated and they're alert and they're, they trust their managers and so on, then you can Im implement security procedures and other uh, projects pretty easily. If you have a weak culture where people are disorganized, that's bad. And the worst thing at all is a culture of fear where people don't dare to report problems to the boss because they think they'll be blamed and fired for it. This is the worst thing. All right, and so your organizational structure, your capabilities, budget and cost, legal obligations, and acceptable risk. These are all things that limit what you can do. You might think it would be great to put everything in the cloud and quit using your local servers entirely, but that might not be allowed for your industry. That might be an unacceptable risk. And then you've got, of course, organizational inertia. People already go to work and they think they know what they're doing and they don't want you changing everything under them. So you have to be aware that you can't disrupt the workflow of people casually. They will resist it, avoid it, and it will slow them down. How often do companies actually pay to get hacked to start preventing it in the future? Well, more and more companies do pay for penetration tests now. But to be fair, most companies have really been hacked by now. So I think most companies have learned the hard way that it really matters. And of course, the companies that hire me as a consultant are relatively mature. All the ones I'm dealing with are very impressive. Like I'm working for a bank and they really have a very impressive security training platform. They are, they are not messing around. Obviously, they have gotten tired of being hacked and they are training up their team to really be prepared, which I'm glad to see. You know, the bigger companies have pretty much got it figured out. Uh, the smaller companies, less and less down to the small, you know, mom and pop shops that have no security staff and no clue what to do. All right, let's try 2B3. Don't need that or that. What I need is this one. There we go. A lot of my students got jobs on pen test teams. It's becoming a bigger part of the industry. So a lot of people really do pay for penetration tests these days. All right, so what finds the difference between your current state and your desired state? That's a gap assessment. I see someone saying, don't you need high level skills to pen test? I think you do. You have to at least take the pen test classes. You have to learn the basic tools. Um, and there's different roles on a pen test too, but um, if you take the, uh, the attack classes 123 and 124, and especially if you get into cyber competitions, you can certainly get enough training here to get you in the door on a red team. You'll start as a junior and learn a lot more on the job. And we have several students that have done that. All right, which one is unspecific but long-lasting? <clears throat>
the policy is the long-term vague statement. <clears throat> All right, what's the highest level of maturity in the CMMI dev system? That's it. Optimizing means you make plans, you implement them, you measure how well they worked, and then you improve your plans based on that measurement. This is the closed loop, which is the highest level of maturity. All right. Which one of these defends you against phishing? User awareness training. All right. Good. It's Judy again. And that person will have to tell me who they are if they want their points. All right. So I'll stop this video.